Hey, welcome back Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy, and let's talk about Barbie and why its ending is so much more than just a clever one-liner. So, on top of all the Easter eggs, references, and little things you might have missed, we also want to explain how the film's final scene brings this hyper-femme coming-of-age story full circle, showing us not only where the capitalistic approach to feminism fails, but also how true beauty comes from our own imperfections. Wow, all that from a movie about a chew toy. Barbie is a lot more than a chew toy, Doug, and if this movie proves anything, she's a lot more than just a human toy. She's a pop culture icon and she has been an influence to children across the globe for over 60 years. The film is filled with deep Barbie cuts and equally deep commentary on the transition from girlhood to womanhood. Humans only have one end. Ideas live forever. The final scenes are not only emblematic of the film's lighthearted and comedic approach to complex topics, but it also perfectly encapsulates Barbie's metaphorical journey into womanhood. Now, if you saw any of the film's trailers before seeing it in theaters, then Barbie is precisely what it says on the box. Pun intended. On paper, Barbie's ending is pretty cut and dry. The final scene of the film has Barbie introducing herself as Barbara Handler, seeking an appointment with a gynecologist. So this is a callback to one of the first scenes in the real world, where Barbie and Ken specifically distinguish themselves as different from real people because they don't have genitals. She has a brand new identity of her own, Barbara Handler, which combines the last name of her creator, Ruth Handler, and the first name of her daughter, the same daughter who was the original inspiration for Barbie. So becoming a woman, biologically speaking, is more than just a clever joke about the immediate need for for women's health care and bodily autonomy. It represents the culmination of Barbie's journey's core message. While it speaks explicitly to the female experience, it has a profound message that can resonate with anyone who sees themselves as less than perfect. Even doggos? Of course, Doug. I mean, it's Greta Gerwig. What do you mean by that? Well, Greta Gerwig is known for her anti-corporate coming-of-age stories, and Barbie is certainly no exception. However, there are also some distinctive sci-fi elements and themes that really distinguish this from other films. I mean, Barbie Land is essentially an alternate dimension. The settings and characters are incredibly detailed and visually engaging, but they also create a very Twilight Zone-esque Uncanny Valley feel, where not everything is as it seems. Gerwig certainly pays homage to these elements right out of the gate, with the first scene parodying 2001 A Space Odyssey, but with girls instead of monkeys and a giant Margot Robbie replacing the ominous monolith. The swimsuit chosen is not only the one from the very first Barbie, but also the same one that she wore on the cover of a very controversial ad of Sports Illustrated. It's a perfect fit for not only the beginning of the movie, but Barbie's story as well. There's also a reference to The Matrix when Kate McKinnon's Barbie offers the choice between knowing the truth with Birkenstocks or returning to her old life with heels, just like the ever so classic red pill versus blue pill. You can go back to your regular life or you can know the truth about the universe. Even Make Your Own Kind of Music could be a reference to the second season of Lost, while also serving as an ominous reminder to the viewer of how artificial their reality is. Now these sci-fi elements are a pretty stark contrast to Barbie's plastic perfect utopia, serving as a metaphor for the disconnect between childhood idealism and the harsh truth of reality. Despite being literally ageless, Barbie's story is still a coming-of-age metaphor. Her journey begins in her childlike, idealized Barbie world, where no one is self-conscious, no one has to work, everybody is pretty, everything is perfect, and set design is incredibly detailed, and completely immerses the audience. It's so detailed that it reminds me of how WB made $39 million last year, but somehow still can't afford to pay the writers and actors a living wage. Right? Pay your people, Warner Brothers. Anyways, this movie is filled with details straight from the toy aisle. We've got Postal Worker Barbie, Malibu Barbie, President President Barbie, astrophysicist Barbie, Supreme Court justices, authors, writers, reporters, and even several mermaid Barbies, all of which are based on actual Barbie dolls. You also had characters like Crazy Barbie, who may not be an officially licensed Barbie doll, but it's certainly one of the ones we remember the most. Honestly, this is the Barbie that most people grew up with, the one that got played with a little too hard and now looks like Cynthia from the Rugrats. You heard me, Cynthia. You're cranky, and you need a nap, so take a nap! Having characters like this creates a layer of relatable nostalgia that makes you truly believe you're watching a story unfold in some child's discarded playset. And she's not the only element of this to do so. In fact, everything in Barbie Land functions as if it's part of a playset. There is no actual water in the cups, and the showers are even on the beach. The doll's movements are restricted in specific ways too, which is why Alan can't get over the fence in that one scene. It's also why, no matter how rough the car crashes are, Barbie's convertible always ends up landing with its wheels on the ground, since that's how a kid would play with it. Barbie and Ken don't even lock lips when they're supposed to kiss. Being made of plastic, the best hopes of making a real Ken and Barbie doll kiss was to smush their static faces as close together as possible, which is exactly what they emulate in their one attempt of a kissing scene. Honestly, I don't remember seeing Barbie kiss anyone for the entire movie. That's because she doesn't. She isn't forced to kiss anyone, which is a pretty refreshing take, to be honest. There are also some pretty direct metaphors that give the film this unique Barbie movie feel, where everything is just one frightening degree away from perfect. For example, her waterless cold shower moment, or 
support even when Will Ferrell tries to literally put Barbie in a box. It also didn't hurt that the set design was absolutely incredible and completely immersive. I want to go to there. Now, while none of the houses are direct replicas, they feature plenty of Easter eggs from past sets, including the ice cream stands, the ambulance, the roller disco, Barbie's glam pool, and the Chelsea Doll Treehouse. Even when the scene where Barbie meets Ruth Handler for the first time is reminiscent of the very first Barbie Dreamhouse playset. Even the shops in the town that aren't actual playsets still help bring a unique life to Barbie's world. She drives past a perfect hair salon referencing her flawless hair and even passes a candy store early in the film with the title misspelled, which is both a reference to the childlike spelling and grammar as well as a reference to one of Barbie's dogs who's also named Candy. Speaking of dogs, can we talk about the pupper in Crazy Barbie's house seen pooping plastic pellets everywhere? I don't see what he did wrong. I mean, humans poop all the time in that big chair. Yeah, Doug, but that's a... T we're supposed to poop in that chair. This concept is utterly incomprehensible to me. Well, all right, poop jokes aside, that dog is likely Tanner from the Barbie and Tanner toy line that featured this pooping plastic dog. However, it was recalled in 2007 after it was found that kids were swallowing the magnets used in the pooper scooper, which probably explains why it was hanging out out at Crazy Barbie's house. Regardless, it's great to see these recalled toys represented in the film, including the pregnant Barbie, Midge, who was discontinued after parents became concerned that she would encourage teen pregnancy, alongside her husband, Alan. The one played by Michael Sarah? The one and only. While Alan was one of the first members of the Barbie cast and crew, he was even more of a useless accessory than Ken, and Gerwig has lots of fun with him. There are even a few discontinued Kens, including Earring Ken, who was recalled because people thought he was gay, and Sugar Daddy Ken, who was recalled for pretty obvious reasons. Why would you do that? Why would you do any of that. You also had Video Barbie, who was recalled when police became concerned that her end torso video camera could be used for really bad stuff. But the best recall toy reference had to be Skipper. You say that like we know who that is. Well, you should. Originally, Skipper was Barbie's younger sister. It was intended to be a younger version of Barbie that kids could more easily see themselves in, but they eventually moved away from the idea and decided to grow her up. This led to the release of Growing Up Skipper, which was supposed to be a little girl that could be stretched and transformed into an adult woman, but was recalled when parents complained about how adult her chest became after her transformation. In the movie, we're told that the only other person to leave Barbie land for the real world was Skipper, who left to surf in Key West. Now, interestingly, they chose the only Barbie doll that actually grows up to be the only other character to leave Barbie land for the real world. And this only further reiterates that her journey from Barbie land to the real world is symbolic of the transition from girlhood to womanhood. It's also important to note that Barbie's journey into the real world only begins to happen when she starts to question her own reality. It's a profound way to contrast the naive expectations of childhood with the harsh realities of the real world and creates a meta narrative that feels a lot like the Lego movie, but you know, all grown up. Hey, speaking of meta narratives from the Lego movie, isn't Will Ferrell in this film? He is, and he plays an eerily similar character in this film as well. He is the meta bad guy, but this time with a little extra misogyny on top. The film spends a lot of time actually addressing how misogyny tends to be the wake-up call that forces women to grow up and face the challenges of reality, particularly through Ken's storyline. In Barbie's world, Ken is just another one of Barbie's accessories. The movie's beginning narration even says that his existence is defined by whether or not he is noticed by Barbie. Essentially, he's treated the same way that women are treated in our patriarchal society. He's only there to be Barbie's object, to look pretty to get noticed and beach. However, when Barbie and Ken arrive in the real world, things take a turn. While Barbie feels sexualized and even threatened, Ken feels empowered. For him, the script has finally flipped. This is why he becomes obsessed and immediately takes the concept of the patriarchy back to Barbie land. Now, while Ken's airheaded himbo quips present the patriarchy in a lighthearted, digestible way, there are still some powerful statements made in this writing. The fact that the Kens go to war with each other is a frightening example of how the dominance of the male ego has a strong tendency toward violence. The fact that the Kens overthrow the government may even be a direct reference to the January 6th insurrection. Even some early scenes show the Kens dancing in white jumpsuits with the letter K on them. Now, while the K clearly stands for Ken, by grouping them together, they may be implying the inherent misogyny behind hate groups like the KKK. They even named their patriarchal revamp of Barbie land Kendom, which is an obvious play on the words for kingdom, but it's also because the combination of Ken and Dominate. It is also particularly interesting that the Kens chose a horse as their mascot, even though there are seemingly no horses in Barbie land. Yeah, why is that? Aren't there like a ton of Barbie horses? Tons. There are multiple play sets, movies, and even video games based around Barbie horses, yet none were seen in the movie, and I think that's because Ken is the horse. Okay, now you lost me. Not literally, Doug, but figuratively. Let me explain. Now, while Barbie has had a ton of different horses, most of them were statues with motionless legs. Kids would just pick them up and pretend to gallop around rather than actually moving their limbs. In other words, they don't actually move, but rather represent the idea of movement. 
just like Ken's. They don't actually know what their end goal is. They want the idea of what they saw in the real world, but they can't quite understand how to fit it in their reality. They're cosplaying a persona of toxic masculinity rather than actual masculinity. It's not a movement, but it's pretending to be one, just like the Barbie horse. The film also does a great job of showing how women can contribute to patriarchal standards as well. In Kendom, many of the powerful women in the land are reduced to playboy bimbos. While author Barbie finally snaps out of the misogynistic trance, she says that she felt like she was trapped in a cut of Zack Snyder's Justice League, which may be one of the best digs in the entire movie. What, are you calling the hashtag release the Snyder Cut guys misogynist? No, I don't think they're misogynist. A lot of those fans were women, but the Barbie movie sure went there. It's nothing new. I mean, the bear made the same joke. Any of you incel QAnon 4 chan Snyder Cut mother want to get out of line now? It's also interesting to note that Ken's outfit in the real world is a black and white cowboy suit with a pink scarf around the collar to break things up. It's the same color scheme used for Will Ferrell's character, the CEO of Mattel, and I believe this is intentional. These characters are essentially reflections of each other, one coming from the fictional Barbie world and the other from the real world. While the CEO of Mattel is literally trying to put Barbie in a box and return things to the way they were, Ken is also trying to diminish Barbie's autonomy and significance with his patriarchal takeover. It makes sense that the misogynistic CEO of Mattel would essentially embody Ken's transition to the real world, and it may even be why the journey from Barbie Land to the real world felt incredibly similar to the one taken by Buddy the Elf in Will Ferrell's best movie ever, even down to a goodbye from Mermaid Barbie that mimics this moment. Bye, buddy. Hope you find your dad. Thanks, Mr. Narwhal. Wait, are you saying Elf is his best? Even better than Tyler Diggin' Night? I said what I said! Alright, fair enough. Sorry. Anyways, Greta expertly uses the clashing of these two worlds to highlight both the positive and negative impact that Barbie holds on the feminist movement. I thought Barbie was a feminist icon. She can do anything! That's true. Margot Robbie actually put it perfectly in an interview where she was saying that Barbie was a doctor at a time when women couldn't own credit cards. You can't tell me that didn't have some kind of subtle influence on society. However, believe it or not, Barbie's incredibly extensive resume hasn't rid the world of misogyny as the film points out. When Barbie confronts Sasha in the lunchroom, she's expecting gratitude. Instead, she's called a fascist and the embodiment of sexualized capitalism. Sexy-eyed catfishism? Sexualized capitalism, Doug, is saying that Barbie creates dangerous standards for women's bodies and is meant to drive people to buy products so they can look like her. Now, before Mattel started creating a more diverse spectrum of Barbie dolls, she represented a fairly unrealistic image to girls. For some, this leads to an unhealthy body image and eating disorders. Selling 15 different dolls to represent 15 different career paths seems to be an expensive way for a parent to say that you can be anything you want. While every company is out to make as much money as possible, and branding Barbie as female empowerment just so you can sell another doll in a different outfit seems pretty exploitive. Like some kind of virtue signaling cash grab, hence why Sasha tells Barbie that she's set the feminist movement back years. Sir, this is a commentary on feminism or a coming-of-age story? It's both. In the same way, Idiocracy addresses the problems of late-stage capitalism, Barbie addresses modern feminism and all of its nuances through a story about growing up. One of the challenges of getting older understands how childhood expectations differ from reality. That disconnect can cause resentment, like Sasha, or a nostalgic depression like her mother. Now, with that said, the world is full of imperfections, and embracing that is a critical part of growing up, which is what Gloria was getting at in the best speech of the entire film. She says, Women have to be extraordinary, yet they are always doing it wrong, amongst many other paradoxical complaints. Essentially, she's saying that the idea of a perfect woman is impossible. Well, that's super encouraging. However, we later hear from Ruth when she's talking to Barbie in the Void that you can't make everything perfect, but you can make it better. This eventually leads to Gloria suggesting an ordinary Barbie, a Barbie who represents just an ordinary person, imperfections and all. But isn't that what Barbie was always supposed to be? Yes, that's what's so ironic about it. Barbie was created to be a blank canvas that girls could see themselves on, and some still do. But in The Void, Ruth also tells Barbie that humans only have one ending. Ideas live forever. The problem is that Barbie has come to present an idealized character rather than an imperfect character that girls can realistically see themselves in. The idea of ordinary Barbie shows that it's the imperfect aspects about us that are truly the most beautiful and define us as humans, not the ideas of what we should be. Which is why the ending works so well. Barbie begins her journey as an embodiment of childhood idealism and ends it as a woman in the real world. It's a reverse Wizard of Oz, where the protagonist has to leave their fantastical home in the world of make-believe to find the sobering reality of adulthood. The movie shows the uniquely human aspect of seeing yourself in a toy, more so than any other toy-based movie, including Toy Story. Now, while it may be weird for Marvel fans to see Gravik from Secret Invasion flamboyantly breakdancing as Ken, the movie takes on some challenging topics and addresses them in an incredibly thought-provoking way. It challenges its viewers to not only embrace their imperfections, but also to re-examine what it means to see yourself as an idea. In the 
end, by becoming a real woman, biologically speaking, Barbie has transcended the idea of what she was before, creating the perfect allegory for the many that grew up seeing an unrealistic version of themselves in her. It's a film that not only challenges typical patriarchal narratives, but also the breadth of what can be done with properties like this. So what did you guys think of the Barbie movie? Any details we missed, let me know in the comments below or at me at Ryan Airy on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe, smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.